Hey, TE, what's going on today? Are you guys excited to be in the house today? Like, I know us women are excited to be back in the house today. It was a great weekend. Anybody with me on that? We had such a great time. And listen, so we are so, so excited to have our special guest back in the house today, Heather Palacios. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, listen, I just want to, we're going to get right into it because we want to give Heather an opportunity to really share a lot of what's happened in her life. So I want to introduce who Heather is. Heather and I have been friends for about 10 years. We met about 10 years ago. Yeah, we met about 10 years ago at a, um, an event. I think they should already have that on. Um, we met at an event about 10 years ago and... Um, we have, she's spoken three times at our church, including this weekend. And so I'm going to let her share a little bit more about her, but she has an awesome husband, Raul. She has two amazing, really good looking sons, girls, That's you true. single girls out they're there. They're single. Can yeah. Like they're, they're super cute, super cute. And they love Jesus, right? They love Jesus. So give it up again for Heather being in the house today. So Heather. We want to just get right into it. You know, Heather has an amazing story. She's got um, a lot that's happened in her world and her life since she was a young girl. And I know there are many people here who have not heard the beginning of your story and actually why you're on a platform now speaking about your life. Can you just share a little bit? Sure. I'd Thanks. be happy to. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, okay. So my story starts when I was eight years old. So that was about um, two weeks ago. Anyway, it was when I was eight years old, um, so that would have been 1981, a long time ago. I wrote a letter to my grandparents and mailed it, and it was, in essence, it was a suicide letter. The letter, the nature of the letter was um, to letting my grandma know that I wanted to die. And uh, back then, you know, there wasn't hashtags and fundraisers and movements for mental health stuff. So um, my parents did have enough wherewithal to know that that's not normal. So they went, they called the church and they said, do you have somebody to come over and talk to our daughter? And he came over and I remember it was 254 South College Drive, Bowling Green, Ohio. Mike Lyon from the church came in, sat in the living room and he just watched me cry and he tried to help. And then we just kind of moved on from that. And then um, fast forward to when I was about 12 or 13, we moved from Ohio to Chicago. And that's like a normal thing. How many of you guys have moved? Have You've had to move. I mean, it's stressful. Hear me. It's, it's not like, hey, can we do this every day? But um, for me, it just derailed me. I couldn't handle the move. And so I wrote on a legal pad of paper um, about an eight-page suicide letter and went into the kitchen, tried to find a knife, found a knife. And as I was beginning to just execute with the plan, the doorbell rang. And um, it was the Orkin Bug Man. I can't make this stuff up. This is going to only happen to this is going to only happen to a, a Michelle a Heather Michelle Funk Palacios. So he had to he was you know had to come in and spray for the bugs and stuff and I'm like tick tock hurry up. But by the time he finished doing what he was there to do, the, my family had come home and so that kind of thwarted my plan. Interesting side note: I found that letter recently. Really? I still have it. Yeah, um, I ha I can't read it. I'm I'm not strong enough to read it yet, but I, I did have I did find it. So. Um, and then just fast forward to when I was in college, you know, I was dating a guy and he didn't want to marry me, <laughs> his loss, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I dated him for like five years. I was like, yo, 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 put a ring on it. Okay. Cause we had graduated college. He wasn't moving with the, with that stuff. So I was like, well, uh, I, and I couldn't handle it. And here, hands up if you Dated somebody and, they, and you didn't marry them. I mean, hands up. Does anybody recall dating someone you didn't marry? Yeah. It's a normal thing. You know, it happens to people. Not you two, because I know you guys have been together since you were, like, in utero. It's true, Heather. Yeah, I know, I know. But that wasn't the case for me. And so I, I just couldn't handle it, that he wouldn't marry me. And, and so I took a bottle of pills. <clears throat> Tried to kill myself because of that. Um, survived that. Was taken to the hospital. Survived that. And then... Again, the last one was July 30th, 2000. Um, I was living in Florida. My husband, Raul Enrique Palacios II, a sexy Cuban is what I like to call him. Um, we had been married for one year. We were both in ministry, which made me a pastor's wife. I couldn't handle it. 
I was like, I knew there was something wrong with my brain. I didn't know what it was. But I knew there was no way I could be a pastor's wife. Uh, the, the two just weren't working in, in my head. Sadly, I that day decided I was going to take my life as a pastor's wife. And so I drove to a parking lot. My plan was very calculated. Um, I went into the liquor store. I bought a lot of alcohol so that I wouldn't feel what I was about ready to do. And then I started to take my life in, the, in my car in that parking lot. Um, I didn't write a letter this time, though. And I didn't want my husband to think that it was his fault. So I called him. And I was on the cell phone with him. And he was being able to, at the same time, navigate kind of my location and keep me alive. He got to the scene, though, and it was pretty gruesome. But it was interesting because um, I had become, Pastor Tim, almost like a demon-possessed person, uh, like a rabid animal. Um, I was uncontrollable, unrestrainable, shrieking, screaming, and had unusual strength. And so he had to call 911, and he did, and, and first responders showed up, six men, first responders, and they could not stop me either from what I was doing. Wow. I think this time I was so mad at failing at trying to die that this time I was going to die, and I was going to I was going to finally be successful at it. But they, you know, were able to tranquilize me. So they were able to knock me out flat, and they were able to strap me down like, Cannibal, like, remember Silence of the Lambs? When he's like, Clarice! And he's like all strapped down to all those different parts and they lift him up and it's kind of a freaky scene. But that's kind of like what I was like. They had me strapped at all these, my head, my chest, my waist, my feet, my arms, all strapped down. And they took me to the hospital, treated my injuries. And then, you know, in the state of Florida, if you are a threat to yourself or to society, they are allowed to lock you up in a psychiatric ward for 72 hours. And so that's what they did to me. They transferred me from the hospital to the psychiatric ward. And that was kind of, um, that was like the turning point for me. I was like, this stinks, you know, because the psychiatric ward was very cold, sterile, and I, w I felt like just cattle, just like cattle. They didn't have a room for me right away, so they threw a sheet over me and put me up against a wall. And I was, I had, I was bleeding, I had throw up on me, I, was half, I didn't have all my clothes, I didn't have a shoe, I had throw up in my hair, and I was just propped up against a wall in a wheelchair, the sheet on me. They finally got me into a room by myself, I was put in a room by myself, I think because I was high risk, I, because of the, the in, I was so insubordinate to the first responders and belligerent, so they, they put me by myself so I wouldn't hurt anybody else, and locked me in a room. July 30th, 2000, locked me in a room. And when they did, there was nothing in the room. Yeah. I, didn't have a, I didn't have an iPhone. I didn't have a TV. I didn't, have, I didn't even have a jigsaw puzzle. I didn't have a mural on the wall to stare at. There was, it was a plain room with a bed. And so I just, started to, I just started talking to God all night long and crying. And I was so mad. I was so mad at God. And after talking to him, I don't know, I kind of just got to a point where <laughs> I made a deal with God. Now, listen, I don't know if you can make deals with God, but I think he gives concessions to crazy people. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, yo, God, here's the deal. Uh, fine, you win. And if you can get me out of this place, I will dedicate the rest of my life to helping people not end up here. And that was 20 years ago. Wow. And wow. we've held up. Whoa. Wow. Wow. You know, you, when I hear you talk, <clears throat> hmm. y'all need to sit down because she's got more to say. I want. I, we're going to continue this conversation. Eleven thirty is going to have to wait. So, Heather, when I hear you talk, though. What I noticed, and you touched on this yesterday in your talk at the conference, you read things about people in the Bible, and you see this, like, this state that they were in, and it talks about crazy people in the Bible and demon-possessed people, and what you talked about yesterday is, no, this is real life. Yeah. Like, what happened then still happens now, only now we can put a face and a name to it. Yeah. So it's not just some biblical story, it's real life. And this stuff still happens today. So let's talk about that was then, this is now. We're in a series called Unfollow. And today is week two. We're talking about how to unfollow our past because we all have a past, 
right? Every one of us, we've got regrets, we've got guilt, we've got decisions that we've made that we wish we could go back in a race. We're all dealing with that. So how do we get past our past? How did you get to the place that you can be on our stage today talking about what God's done in your life? Right. Well, you know, I mean, we all have a past, but we don't have to live in it. Um, oh, stop right there. Right, Y'all can go home now. <laughs> that was good enough. We all have a past, but we don't have to live in it. That's brilliant. Well, I mean, because I mean, God says in Lamentations, my mercies are new every morning. And I'm like, yes, please. Yeah. I'm going to hold you to that because I, I needed a new morning. And so um, the reset for me was God's word, knowing in Lamentations that even though I was in the psych ward and wanted to die, if I made that deal with God and I woke up the next day still breathing, then God could do something. And so... Um, now, how do I not live in my past? Is I I'm a good steward with my present. I got. I mean, I gotta be honest with you guys. I I work really hard. Yeah. As a the diagnosis officially was bipolarity, and I, I do have suicide ideation. That's a, a real palpable temptation for me. But um, I work really hard to fight that battle. I take my medicine. I see my psychiatrist. I get counseling, and I stay close to the church yeah. and the Bible. And I work really hard at that. Sometimes it feels like a job. You, I mean, you guys are seeing this. You're not seeing the journal entry that I wrote last week. Trust me, the struggle is so real. And I'm not on the other side of it yet. But um, I'm working really hard to be a good steward with the condition in the present. Can, can you share, okay, so I know someone's sitting out there thinking, all right, so you're, li you're, you're staying very faithful to your present and not going back to your past. What are some of the handles you can give them on some of the things that you do that might help them today? What like, what are some of the, the, the things of specific, you said you journal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, let's talk well, about that. Well, I love, okay, here's, so practically, some of the things that I do, yeah, because the devil is alive, yeah. He's also a liar, and he does only want to steal, kill, and destroy me. I'm very well aware of that. And so the, one of the best ways to try to get me to destroy myself would have me keep remembering the things that I've failed at in my past mm. and just keeping that on repeat in my head. Um, but the Bible says that I have the power yeah. to take my thoughts captive, and so I do. Um, and with God, I, I listen, this, one of the first practical things I do is I take my thoughts captive. Now, when I mean that, I'm like literally with my hand, take them captive in a fist, you know, and I know that sounds like crazy and cheesy, but hey, it works. So I'm still here. <laughs> it's working somehow, <laughs> but I'll be driving and I will feel, I will feel the dark thoughts creep in. that starts in the back of my brain and it starts to move forward. I will feel the thoughts creep in from my past yeah. being trying, the enemy trying to bring those up again. And I go like this, I go like this, I get it from the back of my head. I put the thought in my hand, make a fist. I speak to it. Enemy, you have no right to me. I am covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is my master. So you are not my hero. Get out of my thoughts oh, no. in Jesus name. Amen. Right. So good. Yeah. Really good. Really and good. then I roll the window down. I throw it out like it's a fart. I'm just like, get out of here. I don't need that in my car. Roll the window back up again. That's so good, Heather. S sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to call things that are not as though they were. That's good. And even in the midst of your situation and how you're feeling, you, you've got to be able to say, okay, here's where I am, but here's where I'm going to be in Jesus' name. Listen, Samuel called David a king long before he had a crown. And sometimes you have to be called the thing that you want to become before you can become the thing that you want to be called. You, you have to start speaking some life over your situation in spite of how it looks at the time. You've got to start calling it, okay, this is where I am, but in Jesus' name, by faith, this is where he wants me to be, and this is where I'm going to go. And I think there's something powerful in that declaration that we can make over our yeah. lives. I mean, my, my mind is not my master because Jesus is my savior. Oh, that's yes. good. Say that again. My mind is not my master because Jesus is my savior. Really I do not have to bow to the thoughts in my head. Yes. I do not have to be subservient to the thoughts in my head because my thoughts can be wrong. Yeah. 
So I, that's why it's Jesus is the compass. Jesus is my guide. My mind can sail through a thousand storms if Jesus is the anchor of my soul. And, and I, I live that every day. How do you deal with people who don't understand what you're going through? Great question. And it's so legit. Because I'm married to somebody that doesn't understand. You, it's one thing to be crazy. It's another to marry it. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I mean, he, when he walked down the aisle, he didn't know he was getting cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He didn't know. He thought he was getting like a nice, you know, vanilla box of cornflakes. Um, hey, but, only at TE Church do you get this. You could be anywhere right now. You could be home, watching TV, sleeping in. Gold. Anyhow. So here's, and here's the thing. People are not going to understand your mental plight. And that's okay. Because when Jesus had his worst mental moment in the garden before he went to the cross. He brought his best friends to be with him. And the Bible says they fell asleep. Jesus, I am going to go to the cross. I'm going to be brutally executed in a horrendous, heinous way. And he's like, you can't even stay watch. You can't stay awake with me. They didn't get it. And, and so I have learned to release people from needing to understand. Here's what matters. Jesus Christ is in my heart. He understands because he went through it. And if he's on the other side of it and that's who's in my heart, that's who needs to understand. Nobody else. Somebody. So good. Nobody Somebody. Else. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's so good. So you release the people. I love you got, that. You I gotta release, release the people. my husband. So you're not holding on to any anger. No, you're not. No, I don't expect bitter. people you're to not, get it. I don't expect. It's not fair to my husband, yeah. who who is not bipolar, to understand my bipolar fits. Yeah. But you it's had a revelation fair. about that. Yeah. You had a revelation yeah. about that. Uh, yeah. Because one time, you held him to it. You don't understand. But then you said, you don't need to understand. Well, it could have. It would. It could have. It would have. I mean, it, it would. It narrowly caused a divorce. Nar by by the hair of my chinny chin chin, which I wax, so it's all good. But I'm just kidding. I'm just TMI. Sorry, I forgot. The women's conference. This, is, this got men here. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that, guys. I'm glad to hear that. I thought it was incredibly shiny. Both well, of you are having no, a great he's, chin he's moment. He's looking right at me who forgot to get threaded. Linda gets threaded. Is it called threaded, honey? I have a full-on beard right now. No, is it threaded that you get when they... Yeah, ch -ch 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 -ch. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Listen, I know it says nothing about Probably mental health, but you need to listen. Have you girls, maybe you have seen this. Men, if you haven't, you need to go with your wife. You can go to places, and these, these women, it is a spiritual gift. They can, th they do this thing, and they're threading their face, and there's little hairs flying every, it's unbelievable. He's been in there when I've had it done. It's unbelievable. Yeah. All right, anyhow, so. It can end okay, up all on so your chest, then. Here's what I want to ask you, Heather, because I think this is so important. I think the church, not, not our church, really, but the church has missed this. How does the church come into partnership with the topic of mental health. Because I've seen, sadly, people that have walked away from the church because they were told in their mental health issues, you're just not praying enough. You don't have enough, you don't have enough faith. You, you're just, it's something that they're doing wrong. So how do we kind of bring these right. elements together? That's, That's an amazing question. All right, let me break it down. Um, First of all is that the Bible, the Bible long before any church in America was rocking and rolling with its pastor, has people that struggled mentally. The Bible also has people that wanted to die. Moses, Jonah, David, uh, Elijah. And so I... I want, I, with all due respect, sometimes I want to say to these churches or these leaders in church that think that it's a question of my faith, really, did you read this? Yeah. Because the, some of the most faithful people in the entire humanity of all times struggled. And God let that be in his word. Yeah. And so if God would let their story be in his word, why can't my story be in your church? Whoa. Brilliant. 
That's the church. Listen, talk about well, this. The yeah. church should be what? And, and our church, listen, we, we live this. And if you're new to our church and you're a little jacked up, welcome to the perfect place Woo! for imperfect people. We're glad you're here. Church is a hospital for sick people. It's not for people that have it all together. Well, Man, we need to be looking and inviting and saying it's okay not to be okay. Let us help you get okay. And here's, here's the difficulty. We know that Jesus said, I've come for the sick and not the healthy, but I don't know if the church has come for the sick. Oh. I don't know if the church has come for the sick. I think we like to see the healthy because the healthy are easy. It's easy to so take good, care of a healthy that. person. When your spouse gets sick and they're being a baby and you got to take care of them, no present company included. I mean, this is excluded. <laughs> I'm just talking about in general, if that's you and your spouse would be like that, that then if it's your spouse harder is sick to take care of a sick person. And he's acting like a baby. Go back to that part for one second. No, but I'm, I'm being serious about the church. If the church is only ready for healthy people, then we are doing a disservice to the people who need help. Right, I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, where, where, where am I going to go? Where am I going to go? I, I mean, you know, the people that I do life with have been, especially the, the addicts that I do life with that are mentally sick, they've been kicked out of their home. Some have been kicked out of their state. They have been kicked out of their halfway house. They have been kicked out of the psychiatric wards. They have no insurance. They have no job. They have no home. They literally have nowhere to go. Well, they should be able to go to the church. They should be able to go to the church. And that's why you're passionate about the local church, because you believe as, as much as or more than anyone that I know, she is an advocate for the local church. And not just, listen, I've said this at Easter, church isn't a place that you should occasionally attend. It's a place that you should permanently belong. It is a place to call home. It's a family that you belong to. So just as we get ready to wrap this thing, talk about the importance of the local church in all of this. Oh, yeah, think. it is. It's so important. I for me, it's, it's a refuge and a rescue for the people that I do life with. They, you know, they have, the, the addicts are, you know, their uh, mental illness and addiction often goes hand in hand. And so when I have, you know, you know, I speak at a lot of the halfway houses in our area and I will always invite them to the church. We will have VIP seating for you. Yes, you can smoke outside. We'll get you all free t-shirts. We'll have the reserve section near the exit because sometimes they can get, um, mentally jolted they need to, to exit but i'm like we i go we go the, i go the extra mile for them yeah, yeah. they are that's those are that's kings and queens showing up to me yeah. they're royalty yeah. all right they are royalty yeah. and thank god and i have a place that welcomes them yeah. so good and that's what i hope that our church is and i believe that that we are and every one of you matters today hey before we wrap this up can i have permission to just preach one minute just, just one minute. I just want to say this real quick. It's hard for a preacher not to preach. Listen, listen to what I'm going to tell you. We've got this idea that Jesus has come to help us, and that's true. He, he, we, we talk about Jesus helping us financially, and Jesus helps us with our kids, and Jesus helps us with our marriage, and Jesus can help us in all of these areas. But what God reminded me of is simply this. Jesus didn't come to accommodate our needs. He came to change our life. And there is a difference between life change and being accommodated. And listen, when I tell you this, you got to get this. Jesus didn't come to make me Tim 2.0. Jesus came to make me Tim brand new. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. 2 Corinthians 5.17, let's put it on the screen. One of my favorite scriptures. If anyone, everyone say anyone. Anyone who belongs to Christ, they become a what? New person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. God has given you a new life. Quit living the old life when God has given you a new life. It's a new day. It's a new opportunity. Come on. You are brand new. Let's celebrate the fact the old life is gone. The old way of thinking is gone. The old addiction is gone. Come on. It's a new life. It's new. It's new. Heather, I'm going to ask you if you would close us out in prayer today. Would you do that? Okay. So put your hand up if you want to feel like you're touching the ceiling of heaven. 
God, I pray for all the kings and queens in this room. They are heirs. They are wonderfully and fearfully made. Before two people made them, you created them. You have called them by name and they are yours. You have a plan for them. You've written it out in a book for them. You've collected the tears of all of them. You, you have plans to prosper them, not to harden them, to give them a hope, to give them a future. Let the redeemed in this room say so. Lord, I right now come against any darkness of suicide, of the murder of a self. I come against the taunting, torturous thoughts of even tempting suicide. I cast it out of this with you, your, your name, Jesus. Your name, we cast it out. We can cast out the darkness, and it has to flee in the name of Jesus. And so we come together and claim that. Lord, free up their minds to do great things for you, for this community, for this church. Let generational curses be broken. It doesn't matter what the generation they come from. It's a new generation now. Let there be generations upon generations of the experienced church people until hell shrinks to nothing and heaven explodes into surplus. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Give it up one more time for Heather Palacios. Come on.